Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our friends and colleagues from around the world. And thanks for joining us today here at What Keeps You Up at Night. Today, my guest is Nate Rakowitz. And Nate joined Gannett USA Today Network in 2021 as Chief Data Officer. And that was a newly created role overseeing the company's vision, strategy, and execution of data, analytics, and science across all business units. Uh, before joining Gannett, Nate served as head of analytics for a leading video game publisher, Take-Two Interactive Software, and he previously served in data and analytics leadership roles as senior vice president at HBO and the VP at a &E Networks. So please, I'd like everyone to welcome Nate. Nate, good to see you. Thanks for joining. How are you, my friend? Good to see you again, Norm. Good. Same here. Uh, so today, too, I guess I just want to prep our audience to let them know that we're really going to talk about five different areas. We're going to talk about data strategy and analytics, data governance, data engineering, marketing technology, and data science. And with that being said, I invite our audience to come in. And if you have any questions of Nate, please put them down, ask them, and I'm sure he will be sure to help and assist in that area. So yeah, looking uh, looking forward to that, uh, and we should have a lot of fun with it. And so, why don't we kind of get started, uh, Nate? Welcome, new new role. And you know, the way I look at it, I don't think any of us in IT would be employed if there wasn't data to be managed. I think you're right, uh, for sure. I mean, and and you and I have seen that uh, growth of data as um, you know an industry in our career together. Uh, you know, the time that we spent together at HBO as uh, you know, the big data boom was starting to happen there in the, you know, around 2015 ish uh, and how data really provided the catalyst for the takeoff of um, leveraging tools like artificial intelligence uh, and uh, everything else that goes with it. But data has really become, you know, the heart and soul of our companies, uh, especially in the media industry, whether that was at HBO or A&E or Take Two or now Gannett USA Today Network. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it is. So tell us, data strategy and analytics, where do we go? What is that all about? So, no, it, it's it's interesting. And uh, and I love the title of this show, What Keeps You what, what keeps you Up at Night? Uh, because for me, what keeps me up at night is solving hard problems. Uh, this was actually a trick that I learned uh, as an undergrad uh, in college, that if you really want to solve a complicated problem, think really, 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 really hard about it before you go to bed. And suddenly what happens, I, I find, is that you wake up in the middle of the night or you wake up the next morning and you suddenly have that answer. Right. Uh, so, you know, what keeps me up at night is coming up with and solving these complicated problems. And so when we solve these complicated problems, you know, among them is how do you structure um, an optimized data organization within a media company, uh, an enterprise data management organization, a data organization? And, you know, they're, they're, the, the world of data has really grown organically, you know, as the boom happened there through the early 2000s and 2010s, um, as companies that were not digital native companies or data native companies uh, grew and went through their digital transformation and data transformation, we've had to, you know, develop those best practices organically along the way. And so, you know, one of the things that I found is that to create really an optimized data organization, uh, requires bringing together the functions that you mentioned, data strategy, analytics, data governance, data engineering, marketing technology, and data science. And we'll dig into each of those here uh, over the next hour, which I'm excited about. But when we think about the data organization, and if you think about the data organization, if it were a business in and of itself, every business has a business development arm, right? That's right. the sales arm, right? That's the That's the group that's out there uh, prospecting leads, coming up with new ideas, pitching new solutions, right? And so you've got this business development arm. These are these are the MBAs of your of your uh, of your organization. And within a data organization, I advocate for that arm to really be led by data strategy. And so data strategy is really about saying, why do we even care about data? What are we trying to solve? What are the corporate north stars that we're trying to achieve? And then on the path towards those north stars. You know, what are the business questions that we need to ask, right? Simply enough. It doesn't start with the data. It starts with the outcome, uh, that North Star, the business questions, et cetera. And it's the role in my mind of data strategy to be that business development arm that's really the tip of the spear of your organization. They're out there, you know, managing and developing those relationships, finding those new opportunities, 
building those proofs of concepts, if you will, uh, and proving that out with analytics solutions out of the starting gate before you get into green lighting, um, you know, the larger initiatives that require heavy lifting from data engineering and data science and marketing technology. But what you really want to have is that, you know, that business development arm um, out in the lead of this supply chain of data uh, or supply chain of insights. And so it all starts with the so what of it. And the so what is really the realm of data strategy to work with business partners throughout the company to determine what is the ideal path forward and what should we be investing our resources in working with them to accomplish? Got it. And, you know, clearly when I think about Gannett, I mean, there's different types of data, right? There's the data for news articles that have to be put someplace. There is the data for your subscribers. There is the advertising data. And I, how does that all, how do you manage all of that? Is that separate in separate compartments? How do you go about working with all of that and segmenting it? I think it's a you know it's a great question and it, and that's one of the complexities of our our, our business at Gannett and um, you know if you're not familiar with Gannett uh, USA Today Network uh, we have probably the largest footprint of local plus national news in the states uh, with publications also around the world uh, we've got a big footprint in the UK for instance and then we've got you know digital products uh, we we also are host to the largest events business. Uh, in the U.S. So if you're thinking about triathlons and uh, those types of events that get organized, we're, we're in that space as well. Um, and one of the key value propositions that we also offer in that local plus national footprint is, you know, partnering with our local businesses. And in partnering with the local businesses, we have a DMS product, a digital marketing services product, where Gannett really offers local marketing services for your mom and pop shops. This could be your, like your local dentist or um, you know, a small business, the SM, the, the SMBs that are out there. And so we've got a really wonderful solution that's that's driven by our product team around uh, DMS, digital marketing solutions. But, you know, when you think about the print, the print subscriptions, the digital subscriptions, the DMS opportunities, the international footprint, the digital products, there are a lot of moving pieces here, right? right. But at the same time, you bring those things together. And I think we've got one of the best vaults, if you will, of content that is out there. And as we package that together in new experiences for consumers, particularly as we lead this digital transformation, um, I think that the content that we have on the local plus national side is really unique and compelling. But to get there, we need to bring the data together. And if you take a look at the history of Gannett, uh, the current iteration of Gannett came together as a result of mergers and acquisitions. Um, they merged with a big company called Gatehouse Media about two years ago. And so you've got Legacy Gannett and Legacy Gatehouse coming together, creating the largest news publishing organization in the country. Um, and you can imagine all of the system integrations that have to happen for that, all of the data integrations that have to happen for that. Super complicated stuff, but that makes our business model unique also. I mean, if you take a look at our model compared to other you know, publishing companies. Um, our model is very different. Um, it's got a lot more pieces, if you will. I mean, we've got over 250 local publishers uh, that each have their own, you know, digital products uh, that support the news delivery for local news, uh, plus augmented reality capabilities, really cool stuff. But there's a lot of pieces, right? And so when we think about the challenge from a data perspective, it's how do we rationalize all that data together into a single source of truth. That's a single source of truth for customer data, for publication data, for market data, for competitive intelligence, and so on and so forth. So bringing all of that together requires that big heavy lift out of the data engineering group, for instance, um, onto you know, a modern data platform that can scale um, in the cloud um, so that we can support you know, the maturity of the data science group downstream and the capabilities that we look to unlock with marketing technology. So, how do we how do we do it? Well, it takes a lot of grunt work. I mean, this is this is dirty, gritty data stuff. I mean, this is in the weeds. How do you? I mean, this is let's roll up our sleeves. There's there, there's nobody that's not rolling up their sleeves in our company. We've got a lean and mean team, and everybody, myself included, is rolling up sleeves. You know, I'm looking at data. You know, I run SQL myself. I am a Python developer myself. You've got to be able to really just jump into the trenches with this stuff to really sort out you know, all of those moving parts and come up with a holistic strategy for a single source of truth. You know, you said something interesting. You're a Python developer and I keep hearing more and more people 
entities, companies, you name it, are going to Python for this kind of analysis, whether it's this or, you know, any kind of network analysis for the, for that matter. So I hear they're going to that. So yeah, it's, I guess that's kind of becoming a de facto way to manage stuff. You know, what I love about Python, and I went back, you know, I, I was a muckety-muck over at HBO there. Um, and when I left HBO, you know, as the AT&T acquisition happened, uh, I went and I said, I, I want to go back into the trenches. I want to get my hands dirty again. You know, I started my career off as a software engineer. Uh, you know, first language I ever learned was Perl. Uh, second language that we then obviously built out many systems uh, in at HBO was Java. Yes. Uh, and I missed it. And I, and I, I was overseeing you know, the development of our analytics practice at HBO on the programming side. And I said, I, re I really want to get back in the trenches there. So I went back and after I left HBO, I taught myself Python and I fell in love with it. Um, it's a great language. Um, there is so much open source stuff that's already out there. So you basically are like a plumber, uh, right? You come in here and you're like, what, which plumbing tool do I need to solve this problem? And Python has every tool imaginable, uh, whether it's, you know, machine learning packages or whether it's, you know, PyCharm, I mean, you, you, using the IDEs there, like PyCharm, which is the one I use, uh, or Jupyter Notebooks, um, it's it's fairly easy to pick up. Uh, and there's a lot that's already built out there for you. So it's it's a really fun language. I encourage, you know, everybody who's a nerd uh, that wants to get in there and just do some data munging and, and, and uh, statistical analysis uh, to check out Python. Yeah, and I'd be curious, you know, to see what our listeners use. Are they using Python or what other languages do they find and what other language help them, you know, within their day-to-day -day environment and tasks. Now we talk about Gannett and if memory serves, Gannett either did own television stations or still does. So uh, it was part of uh, a former iteration of Gannett where oh. they had some television networks as well, but they spun those off into another company called Tegna. And uh, so we have focused strictly on the news right. publishing. And I'm curious about one thing, you know, because you're international, USA, obviously the paper is international. How does that work within Europe uh, in terms of language? Do, do you have to have an editorial desk in each country? So when articles come in, say they're in English, do they automatically get translated? How does that work? So I believe that the primary distribution is, is still via English. Uh, you know, I think about somebody that just joined uh, the company uh, and, and I remember talking with him, he, uh, another former colleague of ours from HBO, uh, Cecil Pang, uh, joined, oh, sure. uh, as, as an architect here, he was, uh, HBO's chief enterprise architect. And, um, you know, I remember him telling me that, you know, when he grew up in Hong Kong, uh, the main information that he learned about, you know, America was from USA Today. And, uh, you know, that was a, a local English version of that. Um, and so I think it's primarily that, but of course there's going to be, um, you know, translations that are available out there. Uh, we, we obviously aren't just about our own publication, but we distribute our art articles through other sources. Um, and that really gives us that reach uh, for the amazing content uh, that comes out of, you know, Maribel's group here at uh, Gannett, USA Today Network. Um, they produce amazing uh, journalistic content uh, and evergreen content and entertainment content and the like. Got it. Yeah, I see one user says they use Python. I'm wondering what some of our other uh, listeners are using as well. So that'll be curious as we as we get into the show. And I see Dervon from uh, Turkey is uh, signing in. Hi, welcome. Welcome to the show. Good to see you. Uh, so let's let's move on. Let's talk data governance. I mean, to me, that to me is the heart. You know, when, when you think about data, it's you know how do you manage it? Uh, you know, clearly with GDPR in place, with uh, CCPA. And, you know, all of the other regulations, uh, if you're not careful, the fines can really become quite, you know, insurmountable almost, especially when, you know, you're talking about Europe, you know, 4% of global sales. So some of those fines get really, really big. We know that from Facebook, right? So, yeah, how do you manage? Talk, talk to it. Let us know about that, please. Yeah, data governance is interesting, um, and it, it it requires a bit more clarification because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what data governance is. Uh, if you ask certain industries and certain professionals, they'll talk primarily about you know security um, and uh, risk management as being the core uh, purpose of data governance, and that may be true in some verticals. Uh, but in my opinion, um, data governance is really more business oriented and exists as a catalyst for 
uh, enabling us to answer those business questions on the path to those corporate North Stars that I spoke about before. And when I think about that, you know, it comes down to something really simple, um, that the outcome, and I'm always somebody that says, what is the business outcome? What is the so what? Why do we exist? Why does this group exist? Why does, you know, why, why does cybersecurity exist? Why does data governance exist? In my opinion, it's really simple for data governance. The outcome that I expect of data governance is data quality, high quality data, high quality data, because we need that data as our fuel to drive all of the analytics models, all of the data science models, et cetera. And this gets into something really simple. I mean, at the highest level of data governance, you know, it's coming up with a common language. Um, we can call those key business terms. Um, so, you know, for instance, when I say digital revenue, does that mean the same thing as when the finance group says digital revenue? Or when I say ARPU, average revenue per user, does that mean the same thing as when somebody else in the company says ARPU, where they may be talking about average rate per user? And so coming up with those common definitions, this common language that we can speak to each other across you know, a complex enterprise um, is kind of step number one. And the question is, where do you start with that? And from my perspective, uh, and yes, Python rocks, I agree. Um, and from, from my perspective, it starts with those business questions. I call them core business questions. And then from those core business, those business questions, we ask the question, okay, to answer this business question, do I have the data internally to answer this? If not, can I procure it through a, per, a third party source? Uh, or if not that, can I model it with data science? Uh, but even in procuring it or modeling it or getting it from our databases, we first have to agree on what is the language that we speak together. Yes. Um, you know, what are those key business terms and do we have a, a catalog uh, of our core business terms so that we are all saying and agreeing that these things mean the same thing? And it sounds trivial and it sounds simplistic, no, no, but it is not. it is the most complicated thing that you can imagine uh, uh, when, you, when you step into a new organization. Nate, uh, I'm, I'm kind of laughing and thinking about those times when I've been in a technical meeting with a bunch oh. of technologists. Target. And we are using the same acronyms, but they were meaning completely different things. So I think that's a good note for our audience. You know, you got to vet out what the acronyms are and what you mean. And I always tell people, before you use an acronym, please say what it is. Say what it is so we're very clear on what it is you're talking about, because one acronym could have multiple meanings depending on the business you're in and even within technology itself. So, yes, I think it's really, really key. And I have to believe many companies probably don't even do that. Quite frankly. Oh, no, no. I mean, this is it's it's you'd be surprised. You know, I talk about when I go into into media companies, I talk about, you know, leading them on these analytics journeys and that journey from descriptive analytics to predictive analytics to prescriptive analytics, where when we talk about descriptive analytics, that answers the simple question of what happened, right? Yeah. And predictive answers the question of what will happen. And prescriptive answers the question of what should happen, right? And you think through the descriptive analytics, which is also based on these basic terms of, of saying what happened, and it would blow your mind how complicated that can be for some organizations and most organizations, especially those legacy organizations that have existed for multiple years um, and don't have this, this, this greenfield advantage uh, because you've got now this need to go through these transformations uh, and the ongoing transformations that need to happen. So you got to lock down those terms and know that, you know, some terms might change over time, but having a process and a procedure for how you agree on that. Um, and uh, yes, be brave to ask the acronym. Yes, uh, absolutely. Well. I, I agree with that comment. Um, you've got to you've got to just come up with these standard definitions. It's so simple, but it's so important um, just to start with that. Um, and if you're on the recipient side of that, you know, push push those that are giving you information um, to hold them accountable for defining what it is that they're, they're talking about. If they present a term, you know, I better see a footnote in that PowerPoint presentation that describes yes. what that term means um, and causes reference to where that comes from. And, you know, the more mature organizations mature towards having a common standard data catalog, if we want to call it that, uh, within, you know, um, a master data management strategy. Um, and it's all about the simple, just you know, are we saying the same thing? Do you understand what I'm trying to convey? Exactly. And, you know, I, I call it terms of art. 
as well. And I wish that companies would get smart about it and begin to publish a book that they give every employee saying, these are our terms of art. This is what they mean. And let it get signed off by the CEO, by the CISO, by the by the CIO, by the lawyers, because clearly, you know, I mean, I've been in meetings with lawyers and terms of art mean something different to them versus somebody in technology. So you really have to settle on each meaning. So, yes, you know, it's acronyms and it's terms of art. I think it's key. That's yeah. And and I love that you brought up some of those different roles. You know, the the legal group is so important in, you know, stewardship of data. Um, yes. CISO is so important in stewardship of data. And when we go back to, again, the, 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 the definition of data governance, what does that mean? And I, I mentioned before that a lot of people tend to think, first and foremost, risk management. And what I'm advocating for, no, is, you know, business management, key, key business terms, this language, high quality data. Um, however, you know, Risk management is still part of the equation here. Security of that data is still part of the equation here. Um, privacy policies, um, ethically managing data is part of the equation here. And people often ask me, well, whose responsibility is it to secure the data? And I and I start by saying, well, it's everybody's responsibility. It comes down to, you know, the, the, the person entering that data has an ethical responsibility, especially if they're dealing with PII uh, or personally identifiable information. See, I spelled out the acronym there. Um, and, uh, and, and so it is everybody's responsibility to secure data within an organization. Now, having said that, I also do believe that there are things like, you know, security detection, anomaly detection, all of those kind of infrastructure needs um, at the server level, at the data transport level that need to be in place and there are best practices around that. And one of the things that I'd like to see is, you know, that responsibility under the realm of somebody that can provide checks and balances against the use of that data from a business perspective. So I tend to be somebody that's on the business side using the data to accomplish these business goals answer these business questions uh, and identify, you know, that next insight. Uh, but having that check and balance out of a CISO organization um, where, you know, you've got this information security officer uh, that is a strong partner to the enterprise data management group, but sits separate from it so that they can provide a check and balance. Um, and, you know, in organizations, you know, I've seen the CISO, you know, they can report into an IT department, for instance, uh, or they can report straight, straight into a board of directors and in other, in other instances but they're providing that same kind of audit, that same control um, around these things to really hone in and secure that environment in a very stable way. Uh, and there is governance around that too. It's just separate from what I tend to define data governance as, which is a bit more business focused. Got it. Let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about data engineering. Another favorite subject. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and we both worked with a, a great engineer uh, there, data engineer there at HBO, uh, Manish uh, Dewan, yes. uh, as well. A fantastic uh, uh, expert in that space. And, uh, and, and I've got, I'm fortunate to have somebody at Gannett, uh, Rich Hoover, who is also equally as incredible, uh, and uh, Cecil Pang, who we, we've both worked with in the past, is uh, also supporting that initiative. But Data engineering is where it all starts uh, because it comes down to the architecture. Do you have a target enterprise data architecture and a target enterprise data taxonomy so that you can build that single source of truth for customer data, right. marketing data, publication data, competitive data, et cetera, uh, according to the, those data governed um, standards? And so it comes down to having that holistic vision of what that single source of truth should look like. What's the blueprint for that? And so that's step number one. Step number two is obviously then getting the data to that. Um, and this is where, you know, just this is this is the hard in the weeds. This is oh, yeah. not for the light of heart uh, work that goes on with, with the ETL or the ELT that's happening there with moving and transforming this data into that blueprint from a very complicated business model at Gannett, where, like I mentioned before, we've got over 250 local publications here in the States alone, you know, not to mention, you know, the hundred plus that are in the UK and, and, and others elsewhere. Um, and so you've got this massive pipeline that has to be set up to bring these things together. And so that's really the, the, the realm of data engineering. And, and we can take a look at, data engineering and think back how that's evolved, um, you know, as the explosion of big data happened, 
what are some of the best practices and patterns that emerged and evolved over the years? Um, you know, I think back to Bill Inman, uh, who, if you're not familiar with him, is the, uh, the, the godfather or the father of data warehousing. Um, and he created those original paradigms for, for, for data warehousing. And then you fast forward a few years and uh, we've got this concept called the data lake that emerged. Right? Yes. And so we've got these data lakes that are bringing in that raw data, untransformed data, so that you can feed machine learning algorithms and, and, and all of those things. Well, the paradigm has really come together um, nicely in this past year, in my opinion, um, that if you're going to build a single source of truth for your core data, I'm not saying all data, for your core data, what I'm advocating for is actually the same thing that Bill Inman is now advocating for. He's come up with a new pattern uh, called the data lake house. And what he's doing in that is really recognizing that there were some really good stuff out of data warehousing patterns, especially if you take that on to cloud-based platforms. But there's also some really good stuff that came out in terms of best practices around data lakes. And so what he's looking to do is, is rationalize best practices across data lakes and data warehousing into a new framework called a data lake house. And so as we think through the modern data platform that we're putting in here at Gannett, for our core data, what I'm advocating for is leveraging the data lake house patterns that Bill Inman released a book, I believe back in September about, encourage you all to read it, um, really good ideas. I wouldn't say the graphics are that great. If there's one thing Bill Inman doesn't have, it's good graphic art skills. Uh, but aside from that, the ideas around data architecture are brilliant. Um, and so there's a book out on that. There's also another pattern emerging that I think is relevant to Gannett um, when we think through the distributed aspect of our company. And in, 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 in these, uh, in large enterprises that are more distributed, I think this pattern makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it's this pattern called the data mesh uh, or the data mesh framework. Um, there's a, uh, a really brilliant woman uh, that has come up with this framework um, and she is advocating for this. I think it came out maybe a year ago, she started advocating for it and forgive me, the name is slipping my mind, um, but uh, there is a, a data mesh framework um, that is out there that really talks about how do you create best practices that can govern across a distributed infrastructure for data. Um, and when I think about our company, aside from that core data lake house, uh, that's answering our core enterprise business questions, you know, across a company of 16,000 people, um, we also know that there's gonna be distributed natures of this. And so what can we do as a data organization to support them without turning it into some monolithic solution that is just a roadblock for everybody trying to get things done. Well, I think the data mesh framework and the data mesh paradigm is actually very strong in supporting those distributed needs. So what I'm trying to find is the right balance between a data lake house architecture for our core data uh, and a data mesh architecture for our distributed needs uh, within the enterprise. And you know, a lot of people in the industry are trying to figure that out right now. Um, and there's a lot of heated debate. There's there's Slack channels out there with people just going back and forth. It's like a it's like a WWE match. Uh, and I think you're going to be, uh, <laughs> I will bring Serena in for that. They're going to bring Serena in here in a couple of weeks from WWE for that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a very hotly debated topic as to what that target architecture should look like. But within that, there's the target taxonomies, those target blueprints that we're trying to fill. And so I think that there is a balance that we need to find, and every company is going to have a different need. Um, so what's right for Gannett with our, you know, massively distributed organization may not be right for, you know, a Netflix of the world with a simpler business model um, than, uh, than, than we've got. Um, so when I think about data engineering, it's really about that target blueprint, that target scalable architecture, whether it's data lake house or data mesh. Uh, and then it's bringing it together, all those data through the pipelines, through best practices. And, you know, we, we think through what are the right tools and technologies should we use an ETL tool for you know managing ETL, uh, you know tools like Informatica offers, or should we manually do these ourselves with our data engineering teams in Python again? Uh, and there's a plug for Python again, uh, not just in data science, but also in data engineering. Um, so that's how I think about data engineering. It's, it's really about enabling those use cases that data strategy and analytics have identified should be greenlit to do at scale ensuring that the infrastructure is in place to do that, that we can scale that up, that we're feeding it with that big data uh, so that we can then you know, accomplish those heavier use cases on marketing technology and the predictive and prescriptive analytics that, um, that uh, the data science group enables. Absolutely, and there is, uh, uh, so Don 
Turnblade just made a comment. I think it's important. Every copy of the data multiplies the size of the attack surface. Right, so consider the blo a blood test, right? The lab has a copy, my doctor has a copy. Yes, everybody does. Yeah, that's, I think that's a good point. Do you wanna comment on that? I mean, where, where, where do we go with that? How do you kind of ensure that there aren't hundreds of copies of information being out there? Or is that just something with which you have to live? No, I mean, that's that's the reconciliation. That's the rationalization. And, and you know, as, as I've gone into prior companies, um, that that was I mean, uh, that, that was a fundamental problem is that um, if you went to five different areas of the business and asked them the same question, you get five different answers because they had different copies of the same data uh, that may have been, you know, one one group has it. It's a day old. Another group has it. It's a week old. Um, and so that's really where you want to get to that single source of truth for your core data. Um, you know, you can't. You can't stop all the bleed uh, in that, if you will. Um, but what I would also say is uh, there, there's a phrase that I like that I think is applicable here. Data does not travel well. Okay. Data does not travel well. Matt, you've got my interest. Data does not travel well uh, because, you know, as you move it around and it morphs and it changes and uh, you, you hit all these different business areas with their own common terms and definitions, and you've got the data that's showing up in these multiple places, um, you're, you're, you're asking for trouble. Um, so the more that you can get that to a single source of truth, and obviously it needs to be replicated in certain areas, um, so it's never going to be perfect, but the more that you can get that single source of truth for your most important core data that is needed to answer your core business questions on the path to your core corporate North Stars, get that stuff into a single place uh, and, and, and try to you know, lock that down um, and then understand that you need to empower a distributed uh, environment. Uh, but it's that balance. It's it's OK. What really needs to be centralized versus what can remain um, distributed? That makes sense. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, whether or not you are a within a managing data, whether you are a user, whether you are in information technology, you're not involved, you're in security, application development. I do think it's a good idea. And what we're talking about now is for everyone with information technology and other areas, obviously, to begin to understand the management. Because I think, too, when you're developing applications, improving them, I think it's a good idea to have in mind the best practices. And I don't know that every developer does because I don't know that every developer has the opportunity to speak to someone at your level to get that done. Right. So I, I remember at HBO when they were putting in uh, Oracle, right, the R3 instance. And I know you were involved with that. And basically, you know, here you've got a $20 million project. But what I recall is that, you know, the consultants next to the consultants that were helped building out that particular instance, you had the business sitting next to them saying this is what they needed. And I know you had some oversight on that as well as related to the data. So, but I think it's really important that there has to be that synergy between all the groups to effectively produce the right outcome and the right results. Yeah, and I think we were we were blessed in that instance uh, to have um, a really visionary leader uh, in Michael Gabriel, who was the CIO there at the time, uh, that really understood that you needed to put those two things together um, in the way that you described. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it was interesting to see you know how that evolved over time as we got into projects like MRI and and some other things. Sure, forgive the the acronym, um, but uh, it, it was it was interesting to see how you know data governance and the role of customer data governance or consumer data governance evolved out of that uh, to the point that we cr created a committee when I was no longer in the IT group, um, a consumer data governance committee where the CIO and myself, we were the co-heads of that. And I was on the business side and, and, uh, and, and the technology side. We were able to model that same thing that you described at an executive level over time from a data governance perspective, which again, got back not to the risk management side, but to how can we leverage our customer data you know, as we launched uh, HBO Now at the time um, to create a more um, delightful experience for consumers uh, on the marketing side, uh, on the churn reduction side uh, as well. And so I think that you're right. I think the 
coming together of the business with those consultants and, and, and that, you know, side by side gets into ensuring that you're solving for the right problem uh, for the business, right? As opposed to just implementing the technology solution according to best practices, which may be great, but you might be boiling the ocean and solving something that's not really important. Well, yeah, and I've seen that a lot where typically uh, you'll take a, an application or a tool and the developers will develop it without actually asking the users, what is it that you need? And that really becomes exasperating and frustrating. So if you've got de developers out there, if you're wa listening to us, please go ask, ask the users what it is they want, because ultimately you have to support them. You know, technology is all about saying yes to the business. No is a bad word when you're in technology. And especially, you know, a lot to the, to the new folks that are coming on into this industry, it's not about no. It's always about helping the, the business and making suggestions. And they, you know that better than anybody. Yeah, and and, and I'll, I'll challenge you a little bit on that um, because I, I don't think no is a bad word. Um, I think why is a better word. Okay. Um, and so what I would say is, you know, and this is something that as you create a enterprise data management organization, not an IT organization, an enterprise data management organization that has analytics professionals and data science professionals, the job isn't just order taking. Um, our expectation for our advanced analytics group is that they are proactively analyzing the data, understanding the business. It's the business development, they're prospecting, they're pitching new solutions, they're finding new insights. Um, they're doing it on their own, not just taking an order and delivering something because somebody asked for it, but proactively identifying that insight. Um, so I think it's um, important that when the business that is coming to the data organization is in fact asking for something. What I have to do is evaluate that against, well, what's the business value of that relative to everything else we're working on? Uh, what's the technical complexity of enabling that relative to everything else that we're working on? And oh, by the way, our own teams are coming up with ideas and problems to solve on their own. And so when a new request comes in, it's not yes, it's why do you need that? What's the business question you're trying to answer? Um, because our job as analytics professionals is also to be asking those same questions. And it's better that we're anticipating that question and anticipating the question after the question, which is the expectation that I have of my data strategy and analytics team. Uh, Jen Fergalt leads that, she's awesome. Um, and so, you know, that's their role is to be ahead of that question, to be ahead of that insight. So that when those requests come in, you say, well, why are you asking that question? And what's the business value or what's the what's the business value of the decision that you're trying to make on the answer to that question? So if I find I can give you this report or I can give you this dashboard uh, or direct access to the data. But, but well, why do you need that? What are you trying to do? How can I help you do that more effectively? I like that. I like that. Why do you need it? Right. So that, I think that's a great question and actually then produces a more informed answer, more of a response. So, yeah, to your point. And, you know, just as a quick aside, you know, it was Manish that really taught me about tables and data. He was the first I mean, person that taught me about the, the what was it, the star, the star, uh, the star architecture? Yes, yes, uh, all of that. And it was just wonderful, you know, so I learned a lot from, from him. And if he's on the show today, that's great. We'll give him a big shout out for that. Yes, he's a, he's a good guy. Yeah, he's really still good. over at Take Two, and he's got an awesome team over there. Great, great team that we built. Uh, that's good. Uh, to, to do analytics and data engineering over there in the video game industry. Very cool. Very cool. So let's move up. Marketing technology. Oh, yeah. This one's a hot one. Where does yes. it sit? Right. Where does it sit? Uh, at, uh, at at, at uh, HBO, marketing technology sat within IT. Uh, I've seen it sit within my group in research at A&E, uh, in technology, in another company. And, you know, when it's when it's further away from the data group, it just creates friction. Uh, it creates trouble because, again, data does not travel well. Um, and so one of the things that I've seen as a best practice is get marketing technology in the same organization as data uh, because that data or because those those marketing technology platforms need all of that data that's coming out of that supply chain that starts with data strategy and analytics followed by data engineering into the marketing technology platform, right? So it's got a, it's part of the supply chain and to, and to divorce it from the supply chain is, 
you know, it's doable. Um, there's lots of different organizational models. It's just more efficient uh, because the recipient of the data through that supply chain is eventually going to be your data science team uh, that's responsible for your descriptive, I'm sorry, your predictive and your prescriptive analytics. Um, but the marketing technology needs all of that high quality data, data that is an outcome of the data governance process that we were talking about. So what you're doing here is setting up a supply chain. And if you have a supply chain that's not part of the same organization, it's doable. Um, it's just more efficient if you if you bring it together. Um, and so when we talk about marketing technology, we're talking about you know the day to day operational aspects of 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 how you're using all of that high quality data to talk to your consumer or talk to your prospective consumers, reduce churn, offer really compelling um, experiences for them. Because you know our job as media organizations is to create a delightful experience for our consumers. And so how are we leveraging marketing technology to understand the voice of the customer, to interact with them in a personalized way, to be able to offer them personalized solutions, right? And so this is, you know, it started, you know, at HBO, we, we started this, this whole world of marketing technology, mostly around email management, right? Email marketing campaigns. Uh, but it's advanced right now to a world where we've seen, you know, on-prem two-ton uh, MPPs, um, massive parallel processing units be replaced by things like Amazon Redshift in the cloud and DMP solutions, uh, DMP solutions like Crux at one point, uh, Blue Kai is another example. But even that world has um, evolved. And that is a world that sat under marketing technology when that reported into me at A&E Networks, for instance. Um, we've evolved, though, towards these CDP solutions away from the DMP solutions. So customer data platforms. Um, customer data platforms are really purpose built for enabling these personalized experiences. And that could be an experience certainly that's plugged into email as one outlet, but it could be, you know, a service that's plugged into SMS messaging, uh, pl plugged directly into the product experience for consumers so that you can dynamically offer them a different content experience uh, or a different monetization experience, depending on the profile of that consumer uh, or the behavior of that consumer. So we get into the world of CDPs, and, and one of the big initiatives that we have this year at uh, Gannett uh, USA Today Network is about installing uh, or bringing in um, a CDP solution. And so we are embarking on that journey to implement um, you know, a uh, cloud-based solution for our CDP so that we can offer that delightful experience to consumers in product as well as through our messaging and direct interactions with them that can enable that you know, delightful experience for them. Um, that's also, you know, in the in, in the um, uh, financial interests of the company uh, as well. Uh, you want to see the the ROI on these these investments. So, so I think the world of, you know, cloud based. Whether I mean, we're, we we happen to use Salesforce. Um, so, Salesforce marketing cloud automation, uh, coupled with you know a CDP solution, um, and we just uh, uh, signed uh, signed an agreement uh, with M Particle, a great CDP vendor. Uh, there's others out there. Um, you know, I've used Treasure Data in the past, and Segment's another big one in this space. But there's a lot of these CDP players that are emerging right now um, that become part of that marketing uh, stack that are using the high quality data. So when we build a single source of truth for our customer data, well, one of the key outputs of that is ingest into the CDP so that we can activate these things real time. So um, re really neat stuff. Um, but it's also creating a ton of data. Uh, so it in and of itself, the marketing technology stack is feeding back into data engineering a wealth of new data that we can merge together and then feed it all into data science. Got it. So let me ask you this. So typically, if somebody logs on, right, USA Today, you know what they go for. So by way, let's say if they're interested in politics, do you throw up or make suggestions on the front end as to specific articles that relate to politics? So personalization to a degree is in place uh, for our publications and will continue to evolve and mature as we bring together this data strategy uh, to centralize this single source of truth so that we can then empower um, even more advanced personalization capabilities like you're describing uh, through the CDP solution, 
through our partnership with our um, our group in product. Uh, we have a really awesome advanced product group. Uh, I'm really impressed with the work that they do. Um, they're way ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, we're getting ready for Web 3.0. Uh, we're, we're all over augmented reality and virtual reality experiences. As you think about, you know, we're about to start into the Beijing Olympics, for instance. Uh, so I think you'll be really excited to see some of the stuff that's emerging within the product um, experience uh, around the upcoming Olympics. Last year with the Olympics, we also had, you know, augmented reality experiences uh, for things like the skateboard park uh, or the rock climbing um, and, and so on and so forth. So, so there's going to be some really neat stuff in there. That's neat. Last subject, data science. My favorite subject. Um, okay. So, so, so this is what I went back and, you know, I saw, I was like, holy moly, man. When, when we launched HBO now, massive launch, right? That's, a, that's, a, that, you know, I was, Part of the team that helped launch HBO Go, I, I think you were part of that as well. Uh, like before that, but you know, seeing HBO Now launch and the challenges that had to be overcome with that project were fat. It was fascinating. I, I, you know, I learned a ton from that. Um, and one of the big things that I learned is they will tell you, "Don't worry about analytics. Don't worry about analytics. Don't worry about analytics. Just get the product out the door." Right. Focus on that MVP, the minimum viable product. Just get it launched in time for Game of Thrones. Uh, that, that season of Game of Thrones that year. And uh, it, it's it's great until day one happens. And now you've launched this amazing product in time for this amazing show. And, you know, the C-suite starts asking questions. How'd we do today? How many people signed up? How many people did this? How many people did that? And everybody's looking around saying, uh, you, you told us to hold off on analytics. Uh, just get the product out the door. And so suddenly it was um, the data scientists um, and there was only a couple of them and it only takes a couple really senior data scientists in a company to make a difference. Uh, we're not talking about a massive army here, uh, but it was just the, the, those, those few data scientists, I think it was Mike and Jonathan, um, over there that were able to get into the data and answer all the C-level questions. And I said, wow, that's really freaking awesome. I want to do, I, like, I want to do more of that. And so it's why, you know, when I left HBO, I went back, taught myself Python. I said, I want to be in the trenches with this data science, build some street credibility for myself so that when I moved on to, you know, managing data science groups at, at future companies, um, you know, I, I, I could call BS and also add some value. Um, and so the data science world is awesome, uh, but it's it's not something that you can go to a boot camp and learn. There's so many boot camps out there that teach people or that, that try and pitch, oh, become a data scientist in four weeks or get your certificate in data science and suddenly you're right. magically a data scientist. And, and everybody that used to call themselves a business intelligence professional is now calling themselves a data scientist. And, and it's silly uh, because data science is really the confluence of three core disciplines. It's, it's the confluence of strong computer science skills, strong mathematical skills, statistical skills, and strong subject matter expertise about a particular domain. And if you think, well, what does it take to get a computer science degree? What does it take to get a, you know, an advanced degree in statistics? What does it take to learn a business or an industry vertical? Well, it takes time and experience and years. And so if you think, you know, computer science, there's a four-year degree. Uh, you know, you want to get a PhD in statistics? Great. There's, you know, there's another four years. Uh, and you want to learn, you know, this aspect of the financial industry or the healthcare industry or the or the media industry, well, that's going to take you a couple of years to learn and build up that. So you're looking at, you know, a solid data science professional. Some people call them unicorns that brings together, you know, that level of experience of computer science skills, of statistical skills, of subject matter expertise. The confluence of that is really the realm of data science. And you can look for those people and it doesn't take a ton. Again, you don't need an army of data scientists. You need strong senior leaders in data, data science that can manage what I call a data science hub. They're basically the people that you wanna put in the driver's seat of your Formula uh, One racing car and support with the pit, uh, the pit crew around them. But you don't need a ton of them, right? You need that solid person that has the, that ability to bring together those things and can lead a team of machine learning engineers, um, you know, data engineers, analysts, project managers, et cetera, but really setting it up with that data scientist in the driver's seat so that they can do the really cool artificial intelligence stuff, the machine learning stuff, the advanced stats stuff, the modeling. You know, we did a lot of stuff with K-means clustering uh, from a statistical perspective in the television industry as one example. Um, you know, I've used neural networks to do pricing optimization in another industry. Um, so it's really about setting up that magic to happen 
that magic of data science that was really something that took off about 2015. Uh, I've got an interesting chart and uh, you can go look at this uh, yourself. But if you're curious, our artificial intelligence is not new. In fact, the first time artificial intelligence was brought up was in 1956 at a Dartmouth conference and saw its hype cycle really um, peak in the 1980s when um, there was the first autonomous vehicle that was created using artificial intelligence. So we think about you know all of the autonomous cars uh, that are out right now. I drive a Tesla and I, I like to put it on autopilot sometimes. Well, autonomous cars and the patterns for them have existed since the 80s. Same thing with uh, all these other patterns that we're doing with neural networks and decision trees. This isn't new stuff. These aren't new patterns. But what is new is that big data came to the table around 2015 that provided the catalyst for the mainstream use of artificial intelligence to do some of the use cases like I've described at scale and at in, in the mainstream. And if you want to just do a fun little exercise, just go on to Google Trends, which looks at search terms, and just put two, two terms up next to each other. I've got a fun slide that shows this, but put the two terms of artificial intelligence in there and put the term of big data in there. And you'll see that it was really big data that provided that catalyst for this 60 year old hype cycle of artificial intelligence to really hit its plateau of productivity uh, in terms of you know the Gartner hype cycle. Um, really some neat stuff. And I think that what we're gonna see is this realm of data science continue now that data is really at the table to explode as we step into virtual reality, as we step into augmented reality. Also technologies and patterns that have existed for about 60 years. Um, there's a, a thing from, I think it was 1962. There was an invention called the Sensorama uh, and you can Google this as well, Sensorama. It was the first real virtual reality experience. Uh, and it was literally somebody sitting in a booth with this wide screen and they're getting hit with aromas and wind and vibrations. Uh, and it was exactly the same type of stuff that you see in modern virtual reality. But what they lacked then was, you know, the content, the data to create an amazing experience and the practicality of, of, of deploying the actual physical product. Um, same thing with augmented reality. I think it was 1965. Ivan Sutherland, I think was his name, the father of augmented reality. Augmented reality is also not new. What's new is the content. What's new is going to be creating these amazing experiences for consumers in augmented reality as we step into web 3.0 uh, or the metaverse um, right. and bring data to the table so that you know as you and i walk around the street with maybe it's our apple glasses uh our, our new apple ar glasses which are rumored to come out at some point you know i walk past i imagine you know from a usa today perspective and a, and a local publisher perspective i walk through my neighborhood Imagine if there was, you know, a Gannett article about that store that was published a month ago that could just magically pop up in my glasses and I can learn more um, by going into this content in real time in front of this museum or in front of this store um, that our amazing uh, journalists have done stories on. There's going to be right. so many cool opportunities, but it's only going to happen when we bring together the data to those new environments to enable this in the same way that data provided the catalyst for artificial intelligence. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Apple's doing a little bit of that, right? I can go near a store, not quite as easily, but I can certainly punch in the name of the store when I'm near it. And sometimes uh, it'll give me information about that store. So yes, but this whole, uh, to your point, we are moving forward and hopefully with those glasses, whether it's Apple, Google, or whomever is putting them out, that um, you will be able to get more information quickly, easier, you know, et cetera. And also, as I'm looking, um, I see a couple of questions here. Age is important for lean cybersecurity. That's a question. Is age important for lean cybersecurity? And Age of what? Age of people? Yeah, yeah I don't, I, I'm not really sure. Please answer me. So uh, the person I, is- I, I love people of all ages. Yeah, I think so. But so, experience matters and experience doesn't come cheap. Um, I like this other question, though. It says, uh, what is the best path we choose now, business-driven data or data-driven business? Um, great question. And uh, what I will advocate for is business-driven data. And that goes contrary to what a lot of the talking points out there are. We have to be data-driven, right? Again, it goes back to the so what. What is the business outcome we're trying to achieve first? Data is there to enable that. Um, if you start with just the data, 
And there's plenty of insight that you can learn from the data. But if you start with just the data, you might go down the wrong path. So always start with the so what. What is the corporate North Star? Why do we care? What are the business questions? Then bring data to the table. And what you'll find is that companies, especially in the media industry, um, as, as, as I've observed it across multiple companies, go through this maturity cycle as they go through digital transformation and data transformation from being first to three stage cycle. Um, it's, it's being first, oh gosh, uh, it's, it's being first data aware. So aware that data is important. Then the maturity of an organization as it goes through this journey becomes data informed. So we've now got data and we're using that to inform and then get into the, 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 the highest maturity, which is data driven. Um, and so in the world of content, um, I believe, and you know, I've been influenced by other um, really brilliant leaders and organizations to believe that data informed is the right point for content and media organizations because you need to leave room for the creative. Um, and so when you're dealing with creative artists, uh, directors, actors, writers, um, there is an, an important component, which is tapping into their brilliance, tapping into their imagination, tapping into you know, that special it factor that only humans still have. Um, and you wanna create the best environment you can to support that and inform it with data, but not say to the creative, you must do these things because the data says so. So you, it's, it's that balance. And I think it's probably different in different organizations and you'll see more data-driven uh, industries but in the world of media entertainment, uh, I would advocate for a data-driven, I'm sorry, a data-informed organization um, that allows for that partnership between data analytics, data science, and the creative. Got it. So I, I think one of the concerns that I have, there don't seem to be that many people at your level that get it. Um, I, clearly, the, mer the emergence and the merging of data strategy and analytics along with data governance, data engineering, marketing technology, data science, there doesn't seem to be that many informed people that have your expertise. What do you see? How many peers do you have? What can we look forward to going forward? You know, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I, I mean, I think it's about sharing experiences like this uh, because in companies that are going through digital transformation, these things grow or organically. Uh, and sometimes you'll get uh, of those parts that I mentioned, sometimes you'll get, you know, data science pops up over here in an organization, data governance pops up over here in an organization, data strategy over here, and so on and so forth. So you get into this organic nature that is disconnected. And so I think the more that we can share through forums like this, um, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to be speaking at um, uh, CDO Magazine and EDM's um, uh, Data for Good conference in March, March 10th. Uh, data good, data for good. Uh, I'm all about that. Um, and and so the more that we can share our experiences with each other to bring these best practices together into a common framework, and that is something that I'm in conversations with CDO Magazine about, uh, that I'm in conversations with the Enterprise Data Management Council about. Um, and so there are bodies that are coming together looking to, you know, build a playbook of best practices for these things. You know, my, my playbook of best practices is, you know, born of a lot of experience in yes. different environments and a lot of scar tissue. Uh, you know, you try this, you learn from this, you, you try this, you learn from that, you try this, you learn from that. You're like, OK, there's the best practice. Right. And, and that's part of, you know, this journey of discovery and learning that we're all on together here. And the more that we can share that with each other and challenge each other. I'm not I'm not saying I'm I, I've got all the answers. Uh, I'm just saying, hey, for, for this business problem, this works pretty well for us. Right. And I, I think you, you pointed something out. You know, you learn, you, you say you have scars. And to me, failure is OK if you learn from it. If you don't learn from it, you're not doing your job. 100%. So that's, that has to be key, you know, I think, and, and whatever you do. It's all about learning from your failures. And when I used to interview people for jobs, I would ask them, tell me, what have you failed at? And how has your company supported you after you failed? That's right. I want to hear those two things because they're both very, very important. Fail well, fast, first, test and learn, you know, adopt the scientific method because this is all part of the scientific method. Absolutely. Hey, I really appreciate it. You know, we're up on that. I just want to share with our uh, listeners that on Wednesday, March 2nd, I'm going to have Walter Kerner coming up. He's uh, right. System Vice President well, and CISO of the National Institute. Yeah, good guy. 
And then Wednesday, April 6th, I'll have Serena Ness. Serena is Vice President, Innovation Program Management for the World Wrestling Entertainment Organization. So that should be a lot of fun and what she has to share with us. So we've got a couple of really good folks coming up in the future. Nate, always a pleasure seeing you and hearing what you have to say. And hopefully our listeners, you know, took away a lot of important stuff uh, because it really is, you know, data management. It's key. Without it, failure, problems, etc. So we're good. And audience, thanks for coming in and listening to us. And uh, we'll see you next month. Take care. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you.